Hi, this is Mark from Arts and Farts. In today's video, I'm going to be talking to you about a vintage turntable, a total collector's item. This is the Marantz 6350Q turntable. Um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of its features, things I love about it. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. The Marantz 6350Q. I thought it would be really fun to make a video about this particular turntable uh, because it's a, it's a piece that I really, really like, something I really treasure. And uh, it's not talked about too much online. It, actually, on YouTube, uh, there are not a lot of videos that uh, talk about uh, the features of this turntable. There's mostly demonstrations uh, and things like that, uh, putting on a record and hearing it play. And I thought it would be kind of interesting, uh, from my point of view as a musician, to talk about what I think about it. Um, these particular turntables are really quite rare. That's actually something that's discussed a lot about in online forums, and they rarely come up for sale uh, on, on a lot of the used sites, Kijiji and uh, Canuck Audio Mart, things like that. Um, so I thought it would be interesting that if you are looking to buy one of these, or one does come up for sale, this might be an interesting video to watch to help make your decision if it is worth the cost and uh, worth buying uh, a used turntable like this. I was fortunate that I got this turntable for free. This is my dad's turntable and he bought it uh, probably in the early 1980s. Um, and I listened to my first records as a young baby on this very turntable. So it really does have sentimental value to me. Um, later on in life, I remember seeing this uh, on our a stereo and always admiring it and only later did I find out it was uh, such a rare collector's item. So uh, a few years back I asked my dad if he was still using it and he's like oh kind of rarely and he actually told me he was using uh, his um, Bluetooth speaker a lot because he tends to like to listen to music outside uh, while he works so um, he let me take this back home with me. So and it's kind of nice because when he comes and visits we often listen to it together and put on some vinyls uh, and listen to some great music. So it's definitely kind of a, a bonding piece. So the thing I like most about this turntable, believe it or not, is how it looks. I think in most cases the turntable on any stereo system will probably be the most uh, visible thing. I actually have this sitting on top of my stereo cabinet so you don't really see the, the CD player or the receiver or the equalizer. It's all tucked away in there. It's really the turntable that sits on top and I think this is really a great model of turntable to have as a presentation piece aesthetically. I mean it's really really beautiful and as a musician I always thought this looked like uh, you know like a fine musical instrument. It has which I believe is a walnut veneer. Um, that's what the, the body is made of, a nice walnut veneer and it actually looks and uh, actually even smells like walnut I think. Um, so it really has that antique -y look to it. If you notice as well, the lid is a sort of smoked color um, uh, dust cover here, and it really does match the uh, color scheme of the, the turntable, and I think it probably has some function, although it wasn't really talked about in a lot of the forums. It's probably the same thing as like how beer bottles and wine bottles are tinted so that the UV rays don't um, uh, don't ruin the, the alcohol or liquor inside of it. This is probably tinted so you know if there's a little bit of light or a sunbeam it uh, maybe will keep it a little cooler on the platter if you left a vinyl record on there. So I think that's actually a good idea. It's functional and uh, it looks really good. So I'll run down some of the features of this turntable. It has a lot of the same switches that a lot of other turntables have. Um, and as you can see here, they're really nicely aligned down the control panel. So um, I'll just go through just the ones that are visible in front here. Uh, here we have the pitch control, which I never use, really, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit further down the line. We have the speed here, speed selector, so we have 33 and 45 RPM. Of course, I have it uh, down on the 33. Um, I guess I should actually point on the other side because I'm blocking the buttons. 
Um, here is the quartz selector button. So this is the 6350Q, Q uh, meaning quartz. So this is a, a quartz lock button. And basically what that does is it locks it into 33 RPM. So I actually always leave uh, that button on and my records always seem to turn at the same speed or I don't really notice any fluctuation of speed. So it obviously still works very functional and I think it's a really neat feature on this turntable. You see it in a lot of other turntables too, like on Technics. Um, but I, I really like the fact that this one has it. We have the auto and manual selector switch here. And I'll, I'll demonstrate the auto function. I usually do keep it on, on auto. Um, and then we have the cueing lever here, up and down. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. That's all has to do with repairs. And of course, the power button, which is actually currently on because it is on auto mode. So I figure if the power button is down, then it's you know technically on standby. This is a piece of tape I actually put here because it has um, like an insurance number, just some sort of number etched into it. Uh, so I thought that would be a good idea not to share that on the World Wide Web or on YouTube. So there's a piece of black duct tape over it. And here we have uh, the indi uh, indicator saying quartz lock with the Q there. And on the front you can't really see it, but I'll show it a bit later on. Model 6350Q, quartz lock, direct drive, auto shutoff. So this is a direct drive turntable, not a belt drive. And it does have that auto shut off feature, which I find uh, super helpful. So onward with the tone arm here, you can see we have the kind of classic curved tone arm, not the straight tone arm that was seen in a lot of uh, later Marantz models. Still have the original Marantz head shell, uh, which I'm really happy about. Again, this uh, turntable only had one owner, that was my dad, so he didn't really uh, change out any parts or lose anything. Uh, so I'm really happy about that. We have the counterweight here, which uh, has a really nice um, finish, which is the same as uh, the rest of this uh, control panel here, kind of like a brushed steel finish. So it's really nice that it at least matches here. And then we have kind of the black plastic uh, meter here, just to be able to see it easily with the, the white, uh, white numbers on black. So that's really nice and easy to see. Uh, the anti-skate control is a little more difficult to see. So you do have to kind of get in there and uh, look at the numbers because it has a lot of glare and shine up top there. And uh, let's see what else here. We have the uh, Morantz logo on top of the tone arm. That's kind of a nice touch there. It really looks like a, a really polished piece. Um, everything else about uh, this tone arm assembly here is uh, pretty basic, very nice still. And again, we have the um, the cueing lever down here on a lot of record players. You'll see it up there. Uh, since this has the auto and manual feature, it is integrated into the control panel there. So it's a little bit more uh, complicated and, and high tech than just the regular manual lever. Um, this turntable still has the 45 RPM adapter. Yay, it wasn't lost. Um, and the great thing about this one, besides being able to play 45 RPM records, is that it has a uh, stylus protractor built into it. So you can see besides the Marantz logo on this piece, we have an arrow here and a little dot, if you can see there. And I think how it works, if I can remember correctly, we put this on as if we're gonna play a 45, face the arrow upward, and apparently we're just supposed to match the a stylus with that little dot there. And so that's exactly what I did. And it seems to line up perfectly and plays records just fine. I printed out a, a stylus protractor online just to be safe anyways, but uh, it worked. So apparently this works as well. So that's a good thing. I keep a little flathead screwdriver where you can keep one of uh, a spare um, cartridge this is really handy to have just in case I have to tighten up the, the cartridge or need to make an adjustment ever, also so I don't lose it. The slip mat on this turntable is in excellent condition. As you can see, it's a rubber slip mat with the Marantz logo embossed on either side. It's kind of difficult to see in this light. Uh, but if you can't see it, there's also 
this little center plate here that has the Morantz logo, the same brushed steel color as the control panel here. And I think that's a really nice touch. It really looks fancy. It looks high end. Um, it is high end. Uh, so I really like that added touch to, uh, to the skid plate. I think it's, uh, it's a nice feature. And if you forget it's a Morantz, well, hey, it's looking right at you there. So this turntable has had a few minor repairs, which I guess is to be expected with any old uh, electronic device. Um, usually turntables uh, require minimal maintenance. I think you have to like lubricate uh, a few parts in it uh, every once in a while. And uh, one of the reasons I'm actually glad I have this uh, at home is because I use it every day in my living room. This is more of my uh, leisurely listening turntable. I have another one uh, a project debut that's kind of like my work turntable that I actually use for critical listening or if I have to consult a, a record, uh, if I'm having a kind of musical discussion or uh, wondering uh, about uh, any details about any music I'm playing. It's kind of a reference turntable that's uh, very, very simple to use. This one uh, has a few little quirks to it. So it's uh, when I'm listening to music for enjoyment, I don't mind uh, messing with this a little bit. Uh, so one of the repairs I had on it, and when I first brought this turntable home, uh, the manual auto button was stuck. So it was actually stuck in auto mode, which is not such a bad thing, but I still wanted the option of being able to um, put it in manual. Uh, another thing that was wrong with it uh, was the spring on the tone arm was a little bit too live. So when I actually took this into the shop uh, to get this... Um, uh, auto manual button unstuck, uh, the guy at the repair shop thought that the uh, release spring in um, auto mode was a little too violent. So actually at the end of the record, uh, what happens is the uh, tone arm will pop up at the end of the record and it would pop up with such force that it would bang back and forth like that. And uh, he thought that, and he couldn't understand why the spring was so active. He had never seen anything like that. So he suggested that uh, when he repaired it, that he exchanged the string, uh, not the string, the spring, for uh, a little less rigid spring so that it would only lightly pop up at the end of the record. And I think that was actually a good choice because I was getting a little concerned with the speed and rate at which this tone arm was being jerked back on the record player. I don't think it would have been very good for it in the long term. So again, they say if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but this was sort of one of those preventative measures that I took. Um, another thing that wasn't working all the time was the quartz light. And the bulb sometimes works when the record player is on, but um, when you drop the needle, it actually turns off. So there's no way other than the button being pressed down to tell if the quartz locking mechanism is on. It doesn't really bother me all that much, so I didn't have them uh, try to change the bulb. Uh, another reason they didn't change it because they didn't have any in stock, but it's not something that really, really bothers me at all. So I just kept it as is. And another little quirk of this turntable, maybe because of the age of it, and maybe some of you watching can uh, let me know your opinion on this. When I first start a record and put it on the first track, if you may, um, I can never get the tracking force to really control the arm. So what happens if I play a record, and usually this happens on older vinyl, is um, you get a lot of skipping, and sometimes the needle doesn't even catch the beginning groove of the record. And on a lot of older vinyls, I find I have to turn up the weight to two or turn down the tracking force. You kind of have to play with it a little bit in order to find that sweet spot. On a lot of newer vinyl, it's not a problem. I actually put the weight to 1.5 and put the, the matching anti-skate at 1.5 as well. And it seems to play just fine. It's just that some of those older vinyl records for some reason, and this doesn't happen with my other turntable, I actually have to increase the weight on it. I don't know if that's good for the record. I think 2.0 is fine, apparently, but uh, it's just, again, one of those things I have to play with on this record player, but when I'm listening to music for enjoyment in my living room, I don't mind making the adjustment to do that. If you look here at the turntable base, I actually put some little brown felt pads here uh, to just protect the, the walnut veneer from uh, the opening and closing of the lid. I tend to do this a lot, and you could already see that 
um, the corners of the dust cover were starting to kind of not chip away, but kind of wear at either corner. So to kind of preserve the finish of the veneer, I put these little uh, brown pads there and they actually match perfectly. You can barely see them and it uh, makes for a much softer closing of the dust cover. So that's one little added feature I, I did with this turntable. So how does the Moran 6350Q sound? Well, I haven't tried enough turntables to really uh, be a good judge of how it sounds. Um, I know that it works well and functions properly, so I think that's, uh, that's a passing grade for me. Uh, I guess the next good question would be what kind of stylus or cartridge I'm using. So this is a Tonar cartridge that I put on here recently. Um, before I had an Audio-Technica uh, 95E, I think it's called. Um, no, wait, it's the Audio-Technica VM95E, which is a you know, halfway decent cartridge. Um, and I originally thought that maybe the reason that I was getting a little bit of trouble with the anti-skate could have been maybe the cartridge or stylus wasn't a very good match for it. So I actually put on this uh, Tonar cartridge and I was having the same problems. But I didn't find much difference in the sound, so I just kept this, uh, uh, kept this cartridge on and I've been happy with it since. I think probably for me the biggest um, contributor to sound would probably be the amplifier and speakers. Um, for me the, the, the turntable is really just a tool to play uh, records that have music on it that might not have been printed on CD. So it's more of like an archival thing. Uh, but as I said before, the thing I like most about this uh, turntable uh, is its aesthetic, first of all, emotional attachment to it, and also because it looks like a very beautiful instrument. I'm a musician, so I can really uh, appreciate this. I don't know if I'd ever pay the, the price that they're asking for for these when they do come up online. I've seen them ranging from around 900 Canadian to 1500 Canadian for a really, really good condition one. Uh, that's a lot of money for uh, an, an old turntable, but compared to some of the other vintage models, uh, it's, it's not nearly as much as some people are willing to pay. So if you're really into Marantz, um, I mean, it's a beautiful piece, uh, so go for it. If, if one does come up uh, for sale online, again, it's very rare, so maybe it's one of those things where you just kind of have to jump on it uh, at that moment in time. All right, so let's throw a record on and see how it works. Here's my rest of my setup here. I'm not using anything too fancy, but I think it actually sounds pretty okay. And again, this is sort of my leisure listening system, so I'm not too picky with it. This is a Technics AV Control Stereo Receiver uh, SAG77. I actually got this for 40 bucks on Kijiji and it works fantastic. Probably so some audiophiles would say, what are you doing with this? this type of receiver with this turntable. I actually think it sounds fairly decent. It's a, it's a decent match and um, as a professional musician I really cannot uh, say anything bad about the sound about this. Of course I put it in stereo mode and it works on my, my two stereo speakers. Class H as you can see there, H+. plus. Um, graphic equalizer doesn't work. This was a bad buy. Uh, TX CD player just a good all-around CD player, nothing fancy, but again, sounds good to my ears. So here's my vinyl collection here, very small for the upstairs vinyl collection. These are more classic vinyls, so I have a lot of classical music. Um, and so working down to the vinyl collection. So I only keep a few records up here. Um, this is mostly kind of classic rock and classical music, a couple jazz records. Um, I keep it pretty... Uh, pretty classy up here since I'm using a, a classy turntable so any kind of uh, more contemporary metal would be downstairs with uh, that system. So I'll give you an example um, of a Best of Jazz Radio Canada vinyl here. Let's see the first few ones that pop up. Francois Dampierre, great local composer. What is that? Ministry. That's more metal, that belongs downstairs. Uh, Alice Cooper. We have uh, Black Sabbath, Sabotage. Again, early metal, but definitely classy for a classic uh, record player. Bit of Aerosmith. And uh, actually a lot of records by Bauhaus, which was um, 
kind of an English goth punk band. And these records were actually some of the first vinyl records I bought on my own that were out of the classical genre. And I bought these actually before I had a turntable because I always thought I'd um, buy one and I never got around it until, until later in life. So I actually hung on to these records without playing them. And I bought these before the whole vinyl revival too. So they weren't that expensive and uh, were, were relatively easy to find. I think nowadays it would be really difficult to find these. I always love the music of Jean Sibelius. Who doesn't? So I'm going to sample a little bit of Finlandia, which is like the unofficial Finnish national anthem. And uh, this work actually starts pretty strong and loud. So this would actually be a good testing piece uh, for any stereo system. So let's give it a go here. So now I'm trying this in auto mode. I was in manual before. So what's different about auto mode is when I power on the turntable, uh, nothing happens. The platter doesn't spin. It's only when I actually drop the cueing lever that the, the platter will start to spin and again the uh, the tone arm will drop. Of course I'm going to put it in the resting position because uh, the tone arm seems to drop really quickly when I when I press the cueing lever. So let's just do it this way to be safe. There we go. We're up to speed. I'm going to just drop it the old-fashioned way. Let's see if I can do this with ease. That was all right. Oh, look, the light's staying on. It's a little bit of static in this record. So that was a much older record and it had just a little bit of, uh, of static to it or maybe the record was dirty so you're getting a little bit of uh, clicking in it. But uh, some people really like that characteristic of, of vinyl records and uh, I don't seem to mind it too much. Um, whether I'm a big fan of vinyl, um, I like vinyl because there's a lot of uh, vinyl records that haven't come uh, on print on CD um, and they're still relatively cheap to buy depending on um, you know what kind of record you're buying. So I actually like them for that reason. It's, it's really a lot of fun to collect them and look for them at uh, used record stores. Again, this is kind of off topic, but I think kind of relative to um, the, the discussion if buying an expensive used turntable is worth it. Uh, a recording technician actually told me one time when I asked her if uh, she was buying into the vinyl craze or if she liked uh, vinyls more than CDs and of course she she said you know nothing beats live performance nothing beats the sound of live performance um, recorded audio is basically just uh, a representation or point of view recreation of that performance if you can if you can think of it that way so it's really just an interpretation of how you want to listen to music po probably one is not better than the other maybe one has more clarity one has uh, more depth, but it's all personal taste. So I think that was a really good uh, argument um, for, you know, if you prefer vinyl or CD, it's really personal taste. Uh, I don't think one is really better than the other, but each has its pros and cons. So I, I really like that kind of very open interpretation to it. So that just about wraps it up. I hope this video has been fun and informative. And uh, if you're a big uh, fan of Marantz equipment, uh, or if you have one of these turntables or a version of it, uh, please leave a comment. Let me know what it is and kind of what your thoughts are on uh, this kind of vintage of turntable. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe.